one of the questions I'm most asked is how to do a season. So uh, here's a guide. Um, there's a written version as well on iRide.co.uk. There's a whole lot of links and stuff on there. Um, but here is the video version of how to do a season. So after doing six seasons, well this is my sixth now, um, I've probably got quite a good handle on at least some of the things you can do to, to make your life a little bit easier when you're doing a season. There are two versions, we've got the written version which is on the iride.co.uk website and there's also this version. So the written version's got a whole load of extra stuff in it, it's worth having a look at, all the links and stuff are in there. First question, one of the most asked questions, is um, should you do a season? Um, in all honesty, the only person that can answer that is you. But, I mean, if you're into your skiing and your snowboarding, um, these are prerequisites, I would say. But if you're into your skiing and your snowboarding, then, um, yeah, I mean, why not? Um, I'm originally from Scotland. We, we, had, um, <coughs> me, we had ski resorts on our doorstep, but I still felt the need to come and do a season. And yeah, you get all sorts, although I would admit I'm a big older end of the spectrum these days, but um, you get all ages, tend to have a fairly shared theme between all of us, um, kind of questioning if that's, you know, 9 to 5 is really for us, and if that's really what we want our lives to amount to. Yeah, so that's the kind of the shared theme, I would say, amongst all of us, uh, although as I say, I'm kind of at the older end of the spectrum these days. Um, but if you're into your skiing and snowboarding, then why not? In all honesty, everything, I've, I've come to realise this recently, life is a, it's a compromise. You don't get everything. Um, you know, the guy that's got the big car and the big house and stuff like that, he's had to work for it. You know, um, and he'll probably have compromised other things. So, in exactly the same way, you'll compromise a career probably. You'll probably compromise the wages that you're going to earn. But, I mean, you get to wake up with the scenery like this and you've got some of the best skiing and snowboarding on your doorstep. It's not for everyone. To be fair, it's not for everyone. Um, but I've increasingly found, I did, I did my first season when I was 20 and I thought about it ever since and I, I, the opportunity came up about five years ago to go and do another one um, and, the, and the time was right for me, I haven't been back since but it's not for everyone um, but if you enjoy your skiing and snowboarding, if you have a passion for the outdoors if you are maybe not so bothered about the material things in life if you've got kind of an adventurous spirit and you like doing I hesitate to call them extreme sports, they're not extreme sports, but if you enjoy the sports and if you enjoy being outdoors um, and if you enjoy scenery and if you enjoy camaraderie of meeting new people and, and making lifelong friends with the people that you're here with as well, then it's probably for you. As I say, it doesn't work for everyone. It certainly works for me and for the people I know. <laughs> Next one is uh, finding, finding work and finding accommodation. And if you're lucky, a lot of jobs actually come with a place to stay. Mm. You'll be surprised actually, M many of the bar jobs come with accommodation. It makes sense from an employer's point of view. These days, to be perfectly honest, with the rise and rise of Airbnb, um, seasonal accommodation is becoming harder and harder to find. So from an employer's point of view, they're kind of obliged these days actually, a lot of, um, a lot of jobs uh, can't come with the accommodation included because otherwise the employers can't find anywhere for their employees to stay. You're very unlikely to pick up work through the summer months. Very unlikely. Uh, most of that tends to kick in when people get back. Um, and obviously, just by the nature of ski resorts, they make ski resorts and, and the businesses within them make the majority of their money through the winter. So um, they work extremely hard through the winter months. And when it comes to the end of the season, they want to get away. As I say, some open again in the summer. Um, but then right after that they will close 
and uh, you get into the inter-season when nothing happens, absolutely nothing happens. The autumn inter-season tends to run between about maybe the end of August and um, start of November actually. If it's tour operator work that you're looking for, you should just apply to them directly over their website. They normally start looking towards the end of the season anyway. And there are some other sites as well. You've got natives.co.uk, workerseason.com and seasonworkers.com. There's also skijobs.co.uk. If you're looking for work or accommodation in the modern connected age, uh, which is almost pains me to say, but Facebook is probably your best port of call. You will tend to find that there's always, depending on the ski resort you want to go to, but there's almost always a season air site set up for each of, certainly the French ones anyway. These days the majority, I mean I found for the last, what, three years, find the accommodation for the season of Facebook. In all honesty, I'm looking at it now, I don't really know what we used to do before it, but, but the same applies to work as well, if you think about it. Why would uh, an employer advertise somewhere else? Where, um, and Facebook has got such a huge reach. You may or may not have success with the next one, um, but if you can, travel as a group. Now, there are pluses and minuses to this, but the major plus is that everything is cheaper as a group. So if you find yourself having to stay, I don't know, on your journey, on, on the way there, having to stay in accommodation, you're far cheaper staying in a group of like two or three of you or four of you um, than it is to take a single room. Always more expensive to travel alone. And uh, in many cases, you'll find it a lot easier as well. So for example, even just silly things like being at the airport and needing the toilet. If you're in a group, you can uh, leave your stuff with somebody. If you're on your own, you get your snowboard bag, your ski bag, you get to take it with you. So, but yeah, travel a group if you can. Speak to people. Now, this one, this one really should be obvious, actually. But if you, um, more than likely, if you have decided that you're going to do a season, it's probably because you visited that resort before, or maybe you're even on holiday there at the time. Best thing, really, ask people's advice. Ask them what it's like to stay. Ask them for insider knowledge. Ask them for contacts in terms of do they know somebody that's looking for um, employees for the coming season? Who are the best people to talk to? Get your face known in in, in a bar and. Um, Try and find out where the season airs bar is and try and talk to people because the best people to talk to are the ones that are on the ground already and doing what you want to do. Get fit before you leave. <clears throat> um, might sound pretty obvious this but way better getting in shape before you arrive in a ski resort and when you're here. That applies equally to going on holiday as well. Um, there's a number of exercise videos and stuff and sites and YouTube pages and stuff like that that you can go to, dedicated ski and snowboard exercises. Both sports use muscles that you don't really use in everyday life. So you're way better getting yourself a little bit fitter. Build the muscle, but it's not just about that. It's, um, to be honest, stretching is probably actually more important, more than anything else. Right? You can get the most weirdest pulls and strains and whatever else. So, yeah, get yourself fit. Getting your season pass. You'll want to get a season pass. Most people want to get a season pass. I mean, it, it never feels so amazing. There's a lot of French who come to ski resorts and they don't actually come to ski at all. Like they do seasons just to work. To get a season pass, first of all, you're going to need a work contract. You're going to need to be able to prove that you are living in the resort. A lot of places will actually want to see that you have a, a rental agreement for your accommodation, or if you're an owner, obviously you can take that as well. But yeah, they want to see that you're actually a bona fide um, seasonaire and the only way that you can really prove that is by having a work contract. If you're just bumming about for the season, it becomes a lot more difficult. You might be able to speak to somebody who might be able to uh, help you out. I'm not going to put ideas here, but you might be able to talk to somebody who might, who might be able to sort of swing things your way. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, they, they want to see a work contract. It'll seem quite an expensive prospect at the start to be shelling out maybe 400, 500 euros on a season pass. But the mass in this is really quite simple. 
the majority of ski resorts these days are charging about 50 to 60 euros a day for a pass. So that means if you go up maybe six or seven times in season, you're already going to be saving money by getting a season pass. The majority of jobs that you'll be looking at will have at least one day off. So, I mean, unless you plan on just being a tourist out here and, and not going skiing at all, uh, you know, like a pedestrian tourist, then it soon adds up and you are far cheaper just getting the season pass. Season air prices. Now this is another one, closely guarded secret. So um, a really a really good idea, you will probably arrive about a week before the, the ski resort actually opens. So use that week wisely because um, you'll find that most of the bars are just starting to open up over that time. So go into the bars, get yourself known, let people know that you're there for the season. Um, it's much easier to prove it right at the start because obviously the holiday makers haven't arrived yet. Uh, as the season progresses, if you haven't been into a bar, you'll probably rightly be asked where do you work and you know all sorts of things. Um, much easier, much much easier if you go into, it's pretty easy to work out, there's not that many bars in most places anyway. Kind of make a point of going into each of them and sparking up a conversation with the people behind the bar. You know, just mentioning that you're there for the year. Save you a whole load of hassles, like, much easier to do it at the start. This one's good. This one's a good one, considering it's made it soon. Um, but yeah, don't injure yourself. Um, you're here, you're, a season 16 to 18 weeks long. You're not here on holiday. Um, you know, you don't have that same pressure to go out and ride every single day from the first lift to the last lift. Um, to, to huck off the biggest jumps, to take the biggest kicker in the park. You don't need to do that in your first few days. Um, on top of that, you will actually find that your riding is so much better through the season anyway. So, um, yeah, take it easy for the first few first few weeks, which is the exact opposite of what I did, and that's why I've got broken ribs. So, um, yeah, it's, it's advice, it's good advice, but it's advice I should have listened to myself. Speak the language. You're way, way, way better off if you can speak some of the language, at least some of the language. Don't really need to be fluent, I don't think. I think if you, as long as you can ask for the major things that you need, um, and obviously so long as you know enough of the language that you can actually understand what people say back to you. That, to me, that's the hardest part, actually. I'm not so bad at asking for what I want, but I'm pretty bad at understanding what people say back to me. When you're packing, you're going to be tempted to take pretty much everything you own. And the reality is you don't need anywhere near that amount of stuff. In all honesty, uh, well I've said this before actually in, a, in another video, but I mean people never ever look at your trousers, I swear. Never look at your trousers and um, you really only need maybe one or two pairs of shoes. You'll find that you'll spend most of your time wearing your saddle pets, so that negates the need for trousers. You'll find also, because I mean, it's, it's cold, sometimes it's cold during the day, but it's definitely cold at night. So you'll be wearing your ski stuff a lot. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonjour. Huh? <laughs> Every Saturday. Okay, je passe la saison ici, so I'll come back, yeah? But yeah, despite what you might think, you don't need a lot of stuff. So resist the temptation to pack everything you own because you'll never wear it and you'll just end up carrying it around with you. Particularly if you're making your own way out for the season, you know, you're going to have enough stuff to lug around with you anyway. In all honesty, you don't really need that much more than you need to go on holiday. And it's a fallacy to think that you've got to take all washing products and stuff like that. You don't. You can buy all that stuff here. It might be a little more expensive, of course, but by the time you add on the extra luggage weight and the hassle, it's not really worth it. Ski resorts are, by nature, high up a hill. You obviously want to be at altitude because uh, that's where you're going to get the snow. But of course, that also means that you're kind of uh, you're kind of stuck in terms of the shops that you can go to. And of course, with the greatest respect to the owners up here, they know that, and uh, they only get to make money over about four and a half, five months of the year. 
So the prices are kind of inflated in ski resorts, even in the supermarkets. So if you can, go down to the valleys. Now this might involve taking a bus down, or if you're lucky, you might know somebody that can take you down. That leads on to the next one, get to know somebody that has a car, or take your own. But having a car opens up a world of possibilities. It means you can get out of the resort, because I mean, I know people never understand this, because uh, you know, if, you, if you're not doing a season, you think, oh, it must be amazing to live in that resort the whole time. But trust me, you start going a little bit crazy after a while, just being surrounded by the same small, well, just being in the same small town, same small village. It's nice to get out once in a while. And obviously having a car, that allows you to do that. So. But it's also handy for going down into the valleys and getting stuff cheaper. Um, supermarkets in the valleys are always, always cheaper than the ones up the hill. And uh, yeah, when you get to know people here, in, well, when you get to know people in any ski resort, you'll realise that nobody shops in the, in the supermarkets here. They know, you know, the locals just don't. They go down the hill, they know that. Uh, in a nutshell, yes. Um, I would love to try and tell you, um, you know, the, the old adage that it's as expensive as you want it to be, but there are certain things that are fixed cost. Accommodation is going to be expensive, no matter what you do. Accommodation is going to be expensive. Well, actually, that's not fair. If you, if you get a job with accommodation, then you're laughing. But it's becoming increasingly difficult. Um, no matter what your views on Brexit are, there is one truth. Um, it has made working abroad, and it has made working abroad in the ski and snowboard industry, considerably harder, both for employers and employees. Um, a lot of the companies have been cutting back this year because of the logistics of employing um, British people in Europe. I have very clearly defined views on um, the legitimacy, or the madness of Brexit. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, you will obviously have your own. But regardless, as I say, it has made doing seasons and working abroad in the ski and snowboard industry and even the summer industry, it's made things a lot more complicated. I would love to say that there are cheap ways of doing things, but honestly, it's France and it's expensive. And then you double it up with it's a French ski resort, you're up a mountain. They know that you're here, they know that you're kind of... Um, I mean, trapped is the wrong word. I can think of worse places to be trapped as such. But your options for shopping elsewhere and for going and drinking and eating and whatever else elsewhere are rather limited. For example, there are places here that you can... I think the most expensive beer I've had here was 12, 13, maybe 14 euros. You don't get drunk at prices like that. Or if you do, you get drunk once and you take out a second mortgage because of it. Um, yeah, it gets a little bit difficult. There's not really any cheap ways of doing things. But you can save money if you, if you shop in the valleys. There's a whole load of bits in, in this article about that. Shop in the valleys, you'll save money. Yeah, see you Be realistic about what the season is. Yes, you get to snowboard a lot and ski a lot. Of course you do, that's what you came for. But you also have to work a lot. It doesn't really matter what job you're looking at, you have to work quite a lot. Whether that be working in a bar or working in a chalet or as a nanny or whatever it happens to be. You work hard and play hard. Yeah, I mean the reality of it is that you will spend quite a high percentage of your time working. And that's just how it goes. But the trade is that you get to go snowboarding or skiing, whatever. You know, you get to do these great things in this great environment. In some of the best terrain and mountains in the world. So, but that is the trade. Um, but you always find that people come do seasons and about this time of year, we're, we're just after New Year just now, and about this time of year people start going home. And it's normally because they had a sort of a fairly inflated idea as to what a season was, or what it was going to be. And um, about this time of year people get homesick and realise maybe it wasn't for them. So you, you find that people always go home this time of year. So just be realistic about it, you know, it's uh, of course, yeah, you're going to have a good time. It's probably going to be one of the best times of your life, but you will work hard. You will probably be in shared accommodation. You will work longer hours than you would normally. You will get paid less than you would normally. That's just how it goes. <laughs> it's, it's a fair trade. It's really it's a fair trade. And on the subject of people going home early, if you miss the first round of work, and by the first round I mean you know anyone that's applying before the season starts pretty much, so anything between about August and November. Um, most of the positions will be filled by November, but 
Um, as I mentioned, a lot of people, well quite a few people, maybe not a lot, but you will always find that there are people who go home at the start of um, January. There's something about Christmas, something about New Year just makes people homesick. And it's maybe just because they've had quite a hard time working over, over Christmas and New Year too. You know, that's uh, one of the busiest times in the resort. And if you're not used to what you're doing, then it can be quite a stressful experience. So you will always find that people go home in January. So keep an eye on the season airboards. Again, you may well find work. Duct tape. And seriously, if you don't know this one already, I promise you, you will thank me for this. Duct tape fixes everything. Anything and everything. Doesn't really matter what it is that breaks, you will have a temporary fix if you've got duct tape. On top of that, people will appreciate the fact that you've got duct tape because you'll be able to fix things for them. So yeah, never leave home without it. Another thing that comes in super handy is string. I know it sounds unlikely, but string and drawing pins. All manner of uses for these things, trust me. And Araldite as well. Araldite's super handy too. If you're a snowboarder, I would also recommend that you have spare binding straps and a mini driver with you. Uh, the binding straps is a big one, particularly if you're out for an entire season. You'd be amazed how often these things break. But if all else fails, if you've got duct tape, you'll be fine. You won't go wrong with a set of earplugs either. There's a lot of things go on in season air accommodation and some of it you just don't want to hear. One thing you'll definitely want to take is a four-way extension lead. There are never enough sockets in these apartments and you'll end up jostling with whoever you're staying with to get power. So I'll take a four-way adapter, really, you need that. Become an expert. And I'm not meaning some sort of pub expert that basically knows nothing but thinks he knows everything. Um, now, th there are certain things that it's kind of useful to know, so a bit of snow safety will always stand you in good stead. But also knowing, well, you'll become a, an expert on the weather, I guarantee that. Every single season here is an expert on the weather. And you, you'll, you'll speak a lot about the weather, so you won't have a choice about it, because people will speak to you a lot about the weather too. Uh, so yeah, you, you pick up things, um, but also knowing, like, uh, knowing what, what's going to happen if the snow comes from certain directions, where it will load up. Knowing the secret spots to go to, the best times and places to go to them. It's not, it's not really all that apparent at this time of year. We're still very early season at the moment. But later in the season, knowing about the idea of following the sun. Because uh, obviously the, the peaks get quite hard overnight and then they'll soften during the day. But if you follow the sun around, um, then you can pretty much get the best snow at any point in time. It's a good thing to learn about avalanche theory. Not just for your own safety, but for the people that are with you as well. That means that if you do get into a spot, you'll be able to help each other out. Insurance. You never ever think you need insurance until suddenly you do. And if you don't have it, you'll rue the day. Seriously, get insurance. I didn't have insurance when I did my ribs this time, so the reason I didn't go to the doctor for a week, nine days. There's a number of different providers, but obviously you, you need sort of backpackers insurance, you need long-term insurance, winter sports insurance. I'll put a couple of links in the text for companies that I've used in the past, but most of them are limited to 90 days, so it's not that much of a problem, so long as you go, you've got to step foot back in the UK within 90 days which actually leads to the ludicrous situation that you could fly into Gatwick or whatever airport, step foot, like actually step off the plane, wait for three hours, get another connecting flight, fly out, and that's you consider being back in the UK. And it's reactivated your insurance. I will never understand why that is. Your other alternative, if you're not that bothered about your actual own insurance, like, you know, for accidents being run over and stuff like that, there's a, a card that you can get here called Carnage. It's a French-run thing. And it covers you for every eventuality, any any accident that you have on the hill, including heli lifting and stuff like that. Um, it's really good value. It's only about 40 years, 30, 40 years, something like that. And that will cover you for the entire season. But like I say, it won't cover you for luggage or for accidental, I don't know, slipping on ice and stuff like that. Uh, you need proper insurance for that. In most cases, I'm not. I'm not going to advise this because I'm not. <laughs> I'm not being held accountable for anything that might happen to other people. But um, in most cases, I think you can probably get away with a carnage. To be honest. More than likely, whatever you're going to injure yourself at, you're going to, you're, you're probably going to be skiing or snowboarding. And I completely appreciate that. It seems like the most pointless thing in the world, but honestly, 
if you've got a claim on it, then you'll realise actually just how much it's worth. Now, if you got get, if you've got to get heli lifted off the mountain, you're looking at it's about eighteen hundred euros or something. You know, even just basic medical care is expensive. Getting if they have to take you down, for example, here. There isn't like a proper hospital here, so they'd have to take you to Sombury or to Alberville. To get you down there by an ambulance is about, I don't know, 300, 400 euros. So it adds up very, very, very quickly. There's one specific company I would recommend uh, called True Traveller. They specialise in backpackers insurance, specialise in season-long insurance, specialise in uh, covering the sorts of sports a lot of other insurers don't. You'll see a link in the, in the text on the website. And um, I saw in the, in the text below this video. But honestly, True Traveller, really good insurance company. And they'll cover you for all weird manner of things, you know, if you want to go jumping off a of mountains and, you know, like even um, parascending. And, and the other thing as well is that they will actually cover you if you are out of the country already. So, for example, if you're watching this and you just realise that getting insurance is maybe quite a good idea, then you can actually go on their website and they'll insure you, despite the fact you're not in the country. Most insurers require you to be in the country and require you to have been in the country for a minimum of six months. True Traveller doesn't do that. So fo follow the link um, either in the article, the, the, the long read, or um, in, in the text below this. You need insurance though, trust me, you do. Get lessons. I mean, seriously, uh, I've known. Well, I mean, I started without lessons, uh, both skiing and snowboarding, and it took it took a long time. And moreover, you pick up really, really stupid habits that are incredibly hard to break from and the line is wrong. I do realise that there's a theory that you can learn a lot of stuff off YouTube, and you can. But the problem is that like there's nobody there to tell you if you're actually doing what you've seen. You know, like, what, like, there's nobody there to tell you if what you're doing is exactly what you think you've seen, you know. Um, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't actually take down the lessons that you can find on YouTube because a lot of them are very good. But really, it needs to be reinforced. Um, you know, you really, you want to have lessons as well, especially your first day, your first day at least. Um, after that, to be honest, even skiing and snowboarding, they're both, kind, they're both kind of the same. You get taught the fundamentals and then you've got to go off and practice them. So. I, I don't think you necessarily have to have lessons every, you know, like every day that you're, you're, you're learning. I mean, it would get extensive, obviously. But if you get lessons, certainly the first day, it'll make a huge difference. You'll pick up good habits um, that'll stay with you for the rest of the time that you're snowboarding. Because you've got to remember, this is all like building block stuff. And if you're doing stuff badly at the start, you will probably just continue to do those, well, to, to work on those bad habits. So, um, you know, the idea of practice makes perfect. Well, in this case, practice makes imperfect because you've learned the wrong stuff in the first place. We've got a deal with Skibro, uh, so you can follow the link on the text description. Um, you get 20, 20 euros or 20 Swiss francs off the cost of the lessons. It's actually cheaper than you'll get on their website. But yeah, lessons for the, at least the first day, definitely the first day. So, I mean, at the moment, I've just got a t-shirt and a fleece, and within my bag is a jacket as well. And that, that's probably about as much flexibility as you need, actually. Maybe a sweatshirt or something if it's really cold as well. But if you dress in layers, it means that you can take things off if it gets hot, and you can put stuff on if it gets cold. Temperatures in the mountains can fluctuate wildly, so it's better to be flexible. Money, and this is a big one actually, because if you use a cash point abroad, you're probably going to get charged for it, depending on which bank you're with, and well, depending on what your bank's policies are. And on top of that, because you're withdrawing in euros, you might often get stung with an exchange rate. So a lot, a lot of the banks operate their own exchange rates, which is completely different to um, the standard exchange rate. So look at your, look at getting yourself another type of card. There's, there's loads of operators out there. This, this is a Revolut card that I use. Um, but there are loads of new internet bank accounts that you can use. So you transfer money from, from pounds into euros or whatever the currency is, wherever you're going. And you know the exact exchange rate that you're going to get. 
Doesn't sound like a lot, but honestly, it adds up. Label your stuff. <clears throat> and I know that feels a wee bit like going back to school. You'll find that most seasoners will actually want to give you your stuff back. Facebook's a very, very good way of being able to say, yeah, I was in a bar last night. Um, has anybody seen my jacket, my hat, my bag, my whatever? But of course, if it's not labelled, it's a lot harder to get it back to people. So, labelling your stuff to people pretty much to hopefully make sure you get your stuff back. As for your phone, make sure you've got like a business card or a sticker on it, so that if it does go missing, hopefully someone's going to be honest enough to hand it back and we'll be able to get hold of it. Anyone stealing the phone these days is stupid anyway, because it can just be blocked with the IME, IMEI number. Anyone stealing the phone these days is stupid anyway, because it can just be bought with the IME, IMEI. <laughs> I can't say that. Get a gimbal or a stabilised camera. Seriously, the internet, YouTube especially, used to be a wash with awful videos, headache inducing videos. People putting GoPros strapped to their helmet, bouncing all over the place. Of course, a gimbal doesn't. A, a gimbal stabilises everything, makes everything nice and smooth. Um, or you can just get one with a uh, uh, sort of stabilisation built in, such as this camera that I'm using just now, the Garmin Verb 360. There's links to this in the text as well. A really good camera, incredibly good camera. It's got GPS and everything on it. It's got overlays that you can put on it so it tells you how fast you were going, where you are, the altitude you were at. Uh, the speed you were going at, um, and then you can draw a trace, like a map trace of, of, of the runs that we've been doing. So I would thoroughly recommend this camera. Really, really recommend it. And yeah, there's, there's links to this in the description. Done a review of that, actually, um, on the iRide.co.uk website. So you can get more information on that there. That removes the need for a gimbal because it's filming in 360, so you can always compensate all the way through. And it does it on the fly as well. Really good camera. Really, really good camera. In terms of editing software, once you've got all this great footage, you obviously need an editor. If you've got the money, uh, I use Adobe Premiere, uh, Adobe Premiere Pro, which is a great, great piece of software. But I found another equally, or almost equally as good, uh, editing software in DaVinci Resolve, and it's available for free. There's a link on the website to that as well. Tracking apps. A few years ago I wouldn't even be mentioning this, but yeah, there's been a glut of tracking apps come out recently. Uh, some are better than others, some are free, some are paid for, but I'd suggest you just download the ones that you're interested in and see which works best for you. Relive is very good. You can use theirs to track and also uh, you can use the website to take a track from a different piece of software, put it on there. Of course if you're using a camera like I'm using, the um, Garmin, you can actually take the GPS track out of that and put it straight in. But it's it's good. I mean, it's quite handy to be able to look back on the places you've been, the speed you were going at. You know, it's, uh, it's it's quite nice. And of course, you've got bragging rights. You can share it with your friends too. But yeah, there's there's a load of different apps. <laughs> Not going to advise you which ones. Just try them out. Try them out yourselves. Yeah. Mobile phone deals. Can't particularly speak about the rest of Europe, but certainly I do know for France. There are much, much, much better prices in France for mobile phones. Take a look around and see what's available. The, the deal in France for mobile.free.fr, 20 euros. 20 euros for 100 gig data, unlimited calls, unlimited SMS. I mean, it's uh, compared to UK deals. I, mean, so I, I don't even have a UK SIM card anymore. I'd never use it, it's too expensive. But I am out of the country a lot. So will you be if you're doing a season. So look around, I mean, it was exactly the same even in Turkey. I was just in Turkey recently and uh, their mobile phone deals are way cheaper than ours. Uh, yeah, French, if you're, if you're in France, free.fr, 1999, yeah, 1999 euros a month for uh, 100 gig data and unlimited calls, unlimited SMS. and equipment. There's a number of different operators you can go to. But we've got special deals with a company called Ski Set. 
they're one of the biggest rental companies in the Alps of all over the place. So yeah, if you check again the website, you'll get a good deal on there. It's, um, I can't remember, it's sometimes 50% reduction or something. So if you're looking to hire stuff, maybe you want to try skiing if you're a snowboarder or vice versa, you want to try snowboarding if you're a skier, you'll get good deals on the link on our website. It's actually cheaper than ski set website as well. So iride.co.uk for that. Keep your lift pass in your salopets. It's unlikely that you're going to lose your salopets. You've, you know, you've normally got them on or you've changed. But you can lose your jacket quite easily. So if you've got a season pass, it's not a good idea to keep it in your jacket. Keep, keep it in your salopets. Most modern salopets now have like a little lift pass holder, um, which is conveniently about the right height for the, uh, the scanners that you have to go through anyway. There you go, a guide to doing a winter season. Although to be honest, looking back at the footage, could have quite easily been a guide to different stages of beardom. As I said, it's not comprehensive, so if, there's a, if you've got any other tips of your own that you'd like to share, please put them in the comments below. If you would like to see more videos like that, remember to hit the subscribe button. We're doing videos throughout the season from La Plana. Now, thank you very much for watching, and I hope at least some of that was at least a little bit useful. <laughs>